The Nazis have been trying to build their base in this small village or small town, I should say, of Langen, just outside Frankfurt, trying to turn it into the first racially pure town in Germany, in modern Germany. And they haven't had that much success because the West German government is very aware of the risk and will clamp down on them. But then the wall comes down and you've got this whole expanse of Eastern Germany, which is economically on its knees, but also has a lot of disaffected youths who are ripping up their Communist Party cards and see the right-wing Nazi movement as a protest movement. And it's incredibly promising virgin territory. Kunin and his acolytes develop a plan called Arbeitsplan Ost, where they're going to ter- go and Nazify the former East Germany. And who better to carry out that plan than the, the guy from Dresden, Rainer Zontag? I'm Scott R. Anderson, and this is the Lawfare Podcast for September 13th, 2022. Since his 1991 death, Reiner Sontag has been remembered as a martyr by generations of neo-Nazis and other far-right activists, especially in his native Germany. Less discussed, however, is the fact that he was also a spy for the communist authorities of East Germany and their counterparts in the Soviet Union, and that a young KGB operative named Vladimir Putin played a prominent role in his rise to power. To learn more, I sat down with Lee Baldwin, the editor of Source Material, and independent journalist Sean Williams, who co-authored a recent article on the relationship between Putin and Sontag for The Atavist, entitled Follow the Leader. We discussed the relationship between communist intelligence agencies and far-right German movements, how those movements reacted to the reunification of Germany, and what Putin might have learned from his early dalliances with foreign far-right political movements. It's the Lawfare podcast for September 13th. Reiner Sontag... Vladimir Putin, and the German far right. I think we should start this phenomenally interesting story you all have pulled together and told kind of with the main character. And that is Gunter Sontag. I may be mispronouncing that, so please please correct me if I am. Who is a central figure, becomes a central figure in kind of German right-wing politics, right-wing kind of far right-wing politics. But then it also has this fascinating intersection with intelligence agencies, and one Vladimir Putin. Tell us a little bit about his background, where he comes from, that informs the trajectory that he ends up setting down on in his life. I'll start with Sean, with you on that one. Rainer Zontag uh, essentially grew up as a bit of a tearaway. Um, He grew up in the former East Germany. He was signed up to all manner of young uh, socialist organizations as a teenager, but he didn't really fit in. Um, he was a bit of a, a bit of a leery kid. He liked, liked to throw his fists around and he had shown signs of bucking the ideological yoke. He'd sung some pretty, uh, critical songs of the Soviet Union at a football match, apparently. And yeah, police had their eye on him, uh, from a pretty young age. And in East Germany, which at the time had one of the most comprehensive police states in human history, uh, any black mark on your record book was enough to really scupper your life from there on. So he was down a pretty dark path from from the beginning and uh, it didn't get a lot better for him. So you pick up your your essay with Santag's life, kind of documenting his young adulthood. He's about 18 years old and he's settling upon what was this kind of popular option for a lot of youth in this era in East Germany, which is trying to find a way to move to the West. And this leads to really his first encounter with what was going to become a theme of his life, which is with different intelligence agencies. Lee, tell us a little about this. How does this this decision to move West ironically kind of put him into the hands of the leading intelligence agency political forces of the East? Rainer Zontag plays into the authorities' hands by, by getting into trouble. He's a bad kid, as Sean said. He goes around punching people without provocation. He doesn't fit in. He gets in trouble at school. His teachers don't like him. They think he's lazy and he's good for nothing. We have all his school reports and, and information like that on this wealth of Stasi files that we've dug out of the archives. And what he wants to do is get out to the West like any teenager he wants to he wants to be able to to buy commercial goods he wants to go shopping he wants to he wants to be able to uh, move around freely and not be 
corralled into these young pioneers youth organizations and have to toe the party line. So he's desperate to get out. And his troublemaking and attempts to escape are what bring him to the attention of the authorities. They throw him in jail. And then he gets out again after a couple of years. And then it looks like he's going to get in, thrown in jail again. And they offer him a deal. They say, well, work for us. Spy on your friends. Tell us information about what's going on around you. And if you're lucky, we'll keep you out of jail. That's how the story begins. Now, how unusual a kind of life path was this for Sontag, you know, the, this, this phenomenon? Because you know, it, he doesn't start with, he's not even the first informant in this story. He's actually informed by a friend of his who kind of initially tips off some of their initial escape attempts to the Stasi. How ubiquitous is this surveillance project and this effort to turn people into informants on themselves, on you know, when Rick looking west, on, uh, how how common is this kind of story that we're seeing in Eastern Germany? Is Sontag's story? To begin with, it's a pretty common story. I mean, the Stasi were an unbelievably ubiquitous kind of panopticon of the, the East German people. I mean, at some point they had almost two hundred thousand informants in a country of I think it was under fifteen million, even at its height. Uh, the population as people were kind of <laughs> streaming out trying to get away, and yeah, like you said. His first attempts to leave the country are scuppered by an old friend who's also an informant. There's a later informant who 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 scuttled another plan of his to get out and, and eventually try and get to Hamburg. Everyone's an informant. I mean, the amount of details that we were able to pick up with Stasi files, notoriously they're just packed full of this kind of quotidian, crazy, granular detail. I mean... When he was put under surveillance, for example, we found some records from a guy who was basically just hanging around his apartment block at night, uh, reporting that you know the lights were on. Uh, I could report from this uh, this trip to to see uh, Zontag's house that somebody had been in the stairwell. Maybe there was somebody at home. These were all official reports that they're passing on to their police contacts. Um, so, you know, you could barely you could barely pick up a biscuit or have a cup of tea without someone informing on you in East Germany. And that really spiraled for Sontag and led him into the hands of the uh, of the Stasi and the, and the criminal police in East Germany, but also the KGB. Now, you know, kind of in your article that there's a possibility, at least that Sontag would have made contact with kind of right wing or encountered at least kind of right wing ideas, political movements, a far right wing, I should say, in his time in prison or in other aspects of his interactions. Tell us a little bit about what the kind of far right ideology was and, and movements were like in Eastern Germany at that time and, and the relationship to similar ideas, either in Western Germany or in, in other parts of Europe. Any ideology that Rainer Zontag would have, done, would have had as a teenager in the 70s um, in East Germany would have been pretty rudimentary, at least before he spent time in jail. For a lot of youths in um, the communist East, Nazism, neo-Nazism was a protest movement. In the, in the West, you might have extreme left-wing movements. When you had a communist government, the way to protest against them was to drift to the right. And he and his friends would have been aware of this, of the idea of Nazism as a way of sticking a finger up at the regime. But they wouldn't have learned much about the Second World War example in schools and the Nazi era would, have, era would have been played down. They would have traded in military memorabilia. Um, some of them at the time might have been out on old battlefields, digging up weapons, things like that. It was only when he ended up in jail that Zontag would have been exposed to real Nazi ideology. And that's because he would have, there were genuine Nazis, war criminals in East German jails. There's, a former Nazi we spoke to called Ingo Hasselbach, who wrote a book about his experience, and he describes celebrations for Hitler's birthday in the prison where he spent time as a, as a dissident, and how people would recreate the red swastika armbands out of toilet paper, which sounds almost comical, but they took it quite seriously. And any time, anyone who spent time in East German jails, as Rainer Sontag did in the 1970s, would have been exposed to some pretty heavy-duty Nazi ideology. It's worth adding at the time as well that the East German authorities were completely blithe about this threat of neo-Nazism in East Germany. Uh, officially, the country was an, an anti-racist, anti-fascist uh, state. So official documentation said that, therefore, 
Nazism cannot exist here. And so uh, we spoke to a guy who was a very high-ranking police officer called Bernd Wagner, and he'd blown the whistle on a bunch of neo-Nazism and, and, and fascist organization in the country in the 80s. And people hushed it up and said, no, this doesn't exist. We're a socialist country. We can't have Nazis here. So there was kind of this groundswell of young, mostly men, who were coming in and out of jail and disaffected with the country, getting spied on by their best mates who, you know, turned to Nazism, which might sound like the most ridiculous thing ever, as an anti-authoritarian movement. Um, and at the same time, the authorities are burying their head in the sand about whether it's happening or not. So, um, yeah, it was a bit of a tinderbox going on in East Germany at the time. It's absolutely fascinating. So meanwhile, the other main character in the story you write, Vladimir Putin, is about to kind of come on the scene here. Tell us a little bit about where he is in his life and what brings him to Dresden, to the vicinity of Sontag, and eventually, uh, you know, to the point that they eventually have a big impact on each other's lives. But where is Vladimir Putin at this point and what is he doing? Vladimir Putin is sitting at this point in quite a boring office in a leafy villa on a Dresden back street. Um, he's been sent there as a fairly junior KGB officer. And Dresden at the time isn't a glamorous posting. Berlin with its, um, with its wall and it is the center of, of espionage and intrigue. And Dresden is a, a, is a bit of a leafy, quiet sideshow. There are a few things going on there, smuggling routes and that type of thing. And it's the head, of, the headquarters of some important East German companies. But really, it's not the dream posting. So in his spare time, he hangs out with local Stasi agents. He meets some of them. At a football match in the early morning, a guy called uh, um, Klaus Zuchold, who he begins to work with quite closely. And they work together to recruit agents, Not again, not particularly glamorous agents. They recruit um, students, foreign students who are there from, from abroad. Um, and they're just um, trying to gather any type of information that might be useful to the, to the authorities. They hoover up whatever they can get. It's, it's worth noting that there's this a strange biography that was written by a Russian journalist in 2000 called First Person, uh, where the guy sat down with Putin and his then wife, Ludmilla, and, and kind of went through these early years. And it just sounds like a bit of a boring job, really. Um, Ludmilla talks about she's struck by Dresden's clean streets compared to and St. Petersburg or Leningrad at the time where they're, where they're from. Um, she likes how there are rows upon rows of neatly pegged clothes hanging on lines outside their apartment block. I mean, she says actually in this thing, we sat on our suitcases, she says, and dreamed of returning home. And at the beginning, we were really homesick. And Putin says that he basically liked to hang out at the pub and get quite drunk on very nice German beer. And he says he put on a bunch of weight um, and didn't really do a lot of exercise. It doesn't really sound like he was living the, uh, the, the high espionage dream at the point where he was a little bit down the road with his job in Germany. So you, you mentioned already the fact that we have a couple of different kind of players here uh, in terms of agencies or intelligence uh, organizations. We have the KGB, we have the Stasi, and then in the article you talk a bit about this K1 unit or, or section of the Stasi that particularly plays the central role with the KGB. Tell us a little bit more, Sean, about how these different agencies were interacting with each other at the time and how that informed their activities and what Putin was up to in particular? Yeah, that's a good question because <laughs> these these agencies sort of worked hand in hand, but they also kept information from each other and they kept certain crack teams independent of other groups. So you've got this K1 division of the Criminal Polizei, the criminal police, and they were really the most sort of feared members of the police force in East Germany. So they're responsible for, you know, rooting out potential agitprop or, you know, anti-establishment propaganda, keeping tabs on people of suspected of wanting to flee to the West. And they're the ones that have a lot of informants on their roster. So they have around 15,000 informants at any one time. Um, and that's combined with the Stasi's so-called inofficiella mitarbeiter. And those are the sort of informal informants, uh, members of the civilian population that are informing on their friends and family, um, which which constitutes this near 200,000 people at the time, which is one for every 63 citizens, which is quite phenomenal. So the Stasi are a separate agency altogether. 
And then in the story, uh, this kind of triumvirate of the KGB, Stasi and K1 come together in this very sort of Delphic way to, to hire Sontag. So technically K1 is this arm of East Germany's police force, right? And that's seen, overseen by the Ministry of the Interior. And the Stasi is a completely different agency that's state security, and they call in the shots. And then, like we say in the story, not everyone in the Stasi is happy that a KGB officer, who we're going to, I'm sure we're going to talk about in a moment, he's now got control over a K1 team that is taking on Sontag uh, to cause a lot of trouble. So the strange relationship between those internal teams also came among the bigger story of how there was this very, very uneasy friendship and allyship between the East Germans and the Soviets at the time. I mean, the Soviets were the ideological allies and the heroes, technically, in inverted commas, of the East Germans. They liberated them from Nazis. That was the official line. But, you know, Germany had also been attacked and occupied by the Soviets and millions of people had died, many of them you know, friends and family members and loved ones of those who were now in the East German hierarchy. So there was this kind of extremely, yeah, like I said, an uneasy friendship between the two nations. And they all play into this strange relationship between those three agencies as well. And interestingly, you you spent some time in the story talking about how the Stasi intersected with the far right wing movement, this kind of counter regime uh, motivated, at least for many of its participants, ideology. Yet the Stasi found a way, no doubt with the KGB's help, to kind of co opt it. Tell us a little bit about that. What was their interactions broadly with the budding kind of far right movement in East Germany? The Stasi have a relationship with the far right in Germany that goes all the way back at least to, to the 1960s and possibly to the 50s as, as well, when neo-Nazism first started to, to rear its head in West Germany. And at the time, it was there were strategic motives to the support of the KGB and the Stasi for West German neo-Nazis. They saw it as a way to embarrass the West German government. They could for example, by strengthening neo-Nazis, they could show that the West German government couldn't keep its house in order. But at the same time, if the West German react- government reacted and banned far-right parties, then the East Germans could point the finger at them and say, look, they're pretending to be democratic, but they're actually banning political movements. They're not really what they see and claim that they were hypocritical. That's changed by Rainer Sonntag's day or beginning to change. And in the 70s and 80s, what you've got is a much more pragmatic approach The Stasi and the KGB are keeping their eyes on West German neo-Nazis and indeed um, incipient neo-Nazi movements in in the East. But they're really just wanting to keep tabs on them. They're keeping tabs on West German neo-Nazis because they're worried about them taking, getting a foothold in the East and an anti-regime movement spreading there. And that's probably the main motivation by that point. So at this point, I think we can take our kind of two main characters and bring them together because this is where their story intersects. Tell us about how Reiner Zontag ends up building this relationship with the Stasi and through them, the KGB and Vladimir Putin, and what it facilitates him to do in terms of moving into the West and playing a different sort of role there. What What is it that the Stasi and the KGB do to facilitate that? What do they expect from Sontag in return? So before we get to the actual the confluence of these characters, there's another guy that we need to bring into to play, and that is a German named Georg Hannes Schneider. And he is a K-1 officer, and he's a former Dresden policeman. And by all accounts, he's a bit of a Lothario um, and potential abuser he's got a bit of a dark past he he is kind of in bed with potential mafiosi and he's uh intensely loyal to whom he's working with which is great for putin and through schneider putin gets a hold of sontag and really gives him this opportunity to become something more than a low-ranking police informant and and become somebody who they could send across the Iron Curtain and make contact with people in the West 
and then uh, inform on them and give them information that, that Putin and Schneider and Zuchold, the third of those guys, could really use for, for East Germany. Schneider is um, Putin's right-hand man, and Putin begins to succeed as a KGB officer in Dresden because Schneider is brilliant at recruiting agents. So Schneider goes out, recruits all these people onto their roster, and as Schneider succeeds, Putin succeeds too. And so Sontag, at this point, he's able to make this jump to the West, right? He's applied essentially to get permission to go to the West in some capacity that ends up on the Stasi's desk. So tell us, what is this sort of relationship that they specifically carve out? And then what does Sontag end up doing once he arrives in the West? What sort of roles does he begin to fill? Sontag's at a dead end. His, he's got out of prison. His career's going nowhere. He, he drifts between a series of fa- fairly menial jobs, warehouse jobs, packing jobs, that kind of thing, and eventually gets fed up and he puts in an application to leave to go to the West. Now, the problem is with the, there's a sort of paradox uh, in East Germany where asking to, the, to leave immediately registers you with the East German authorities as someone who's suspected of wanting to leave and then they up their <laughs> surveillance on you. So it's a kind of, in a bizarre way, he, he's trying to get out, but it just increases um, their hold on him all the more. And the Stasi deploy significant resources, sending agents to trail him and watch it and watch him, um, yielding all sort of incredibly banal information that we can find in the files now that Sean was talking about before. They stand outside his house, um, they stand in the corridor, they talk to his friends, they talk to his former school teachers, and they they fatten their their dossier on him. And this goes on for quite some time, and Sontag's desperate to get out, but he can't get permission. And then something changes, and he's released. And apparently what changes is that, again, he's offered a deal. You can get out and go to the West, but in return, you're going to work for us. And this is Putin, through his assistant, Schneider, who are offering him this, this way out. And so with their assistance and their support, Sontag is able to, to skip over the wall to the West. They're taking a bit of a punt on him. He's no great agent at this point. He's a fairly low life. He's not trusted with any great responsibility. And indeed, they have no guarantee that he'll maintain contact with them once he's in the West. He could simply disappear. Actually, he's going to surprise them and be a much more influential agent than they could possibly have imagined. But first, he just drifts to a refugee camp where they absorb a large number of East Germans escaping to the West or being bought free by the West German government, as frequently happened. Political prisoners were often ransomed in that way. He spends time in the refugee camp, and then he drifts to the red light district in Frankfurt. He ends up working as a doorman in various brothels, a slut minder, as he likes to call himself. He drifts through the the underworld he picks up a couple of convictions for assault and um weapons possession and it's around about this time that he makes the contact that will that will change the not very long remainder of his life he uh, makes contact with a guy called Michael Kuhnen who's the most important west german neo nazi so that's another really important thread of the story here Sean tell us a little bit about where West German far-right movements were at this point, and who this Kunin is, what role he's playing in this broader movement that makes Sontag's proximity to him such a potent connection. Yeah, um, the, the neo-Nazi movement in West Germany at the time was was fairly significant. There were many, many attacks, especially on on migrants coming from not just Eastern European nations fleeing communism, but also across the Middle East and Africa, uh, many of them coming into refugee camps like the one in Langen, where Sontag lands after getting across the Iron Curtain. And many of these people are what you might imagine, you know, when you think of neo-Nazi groups, they're kind of thuggish, skinhead, some in biker gangs, drug dealers, various sort of low-level gangs uh, with this ideological veneer. Uh, Kunin is something slightly different. He's first of all, he looks very different. He's this kind of rakish. I think we wrote in the the story that he looks like someone that could have been drawn straight out of a Lenny Riefenstahl um, Nazi propaganda movie. And he has this. He has an intellect to go with this far right ideology. He realizes that he wants to get 
political power, not just sort of rule the streets. And to do that, he sort of pitches an idea that he's basically going to play a uh, political whack-a-mole with the authorities. So he sets up one party, it's banned by the authorities. He sets up another with a slightly different name. And this kind of cat and mouse situation goes on for years. He also pitches up in this town of Langham, which is, I, I spent some time there. It's it's like a short train journey outside of Frankfurt. And he rocks up with a, with a gang of these neo-Nazis and they start flyering schools. They stake out parks and playgrounds. They, they beat up piece of people of colour in the town and they want to turn this one town in the middle of Germany, Ausländer frei, which is, which means foreigner free. And they can do that far easier in a place like Langen, which is just a few thousand people and that they could in a, in a big city like Frankfurt. Uh, and we spoke to one of the guys who was one of his deputies called Christian Vosch. And he said that quote, 20 men in Langen are worth 200, 300 or 400 in Frankfurt. So he's building this, what he wants to be some kind of a, another Nazi Reich in the middle of Germany in this small town of Langen. And that's going to bring him straight into contact with Rainer Zontag. So, Lee, tell us about the role that Reiner comes to play in this hierarchy that Kunin set up. Um, I mean, he eventually becomes essentially his, his right-hand man and then rises to, for an even more important role. And then tell us a little bit about what this means in terms of Vladimir Putin, the KGB, and the Stasi, for whom Sandeg is still an agent. Um, in the article, you suggest we don't have a lot of granularity about what exactly they were asking him to do and what exactly he was providing back in regards to information. But do we have a sense uh, or enough information to be able to make informed speculation about what sort of relationship they were maintaining and cultivating? Rainer Zontag, there are two main things that stand out about his personality. One we've um, we, we've touched on already, which is that he's a thug. He's pretty handy with his fists, and he becomes Kunin's enforcer. He's his head of security. He's his bodyguard. When the Nazis have marches and protests, he's in the front line. When they're not at their protests, he's the guy running, um, leading the running battles with with clubs and and chains and and, and knives in the streets against left wing youths and he's he's in charge of basically the violent side kunin as we've said is quite a sophisticated politician he's got a a, a well thought out ideology he knows how to manipulate the political system he's the brains and zontag is very much the brawn at the time as you've said we don't know that much about the relationship between zontag and his handlers but they're fairly pragmatic I don't, we don't think that they particularly want have a have a strategy for manipulating Zontag for any end. But Kunin is becoming scarily important at this point. Suddenly, there's this huge upsurge in right wing violence in Germany in the in the second half of the 1980s. There are lots of violent incidents, but there are also there's also success for extreme right parties in local elections and the specter of Nazism is suddenly rising again in a way that's quite terrifying. That the East German authorities and the KGB will be thinking could possibly spread back to East Germany. And with Sontag being Kunin's right-hand man, they've got a, a key line straight into the heart of the Nazi movement, which is useful information for them. That said, Sontag's importance as a neo-Nazi really comes into its own after a couple of years when the Berlin Wall comes down. The Nazis have been trying to build their base in this small village or small town, I should say, of Langen just outside Frankfurt, trying to turn it into the first racially pure town in Germany, in modern Germany. And they haven't had that much success because the West German government is very aware of the risk and will clamp down on them. But then the wall comes down and you've got this whole expanse of Eastern Germany, which is economically on its knees, but also has a lot of disaffected youths who are ripping up their Communist Party cards and see the right wing Nazi movement as a protest movement. And it's incredibly promising virgin territory. Kunin and his acolytes develop a plan called Arbeitsplan Ost, where they're going to go and Nazify the former East Germany. And who better to carry out that plan than the, the guy from Dresden, Rainer Sontag? So we have this movement where Sontag has, has worked his way up 
to the highest echelon of this West German far right movement. And then they make, as you know, this this leap back to the East, this transition. Tell us about how that goes, Sean, and 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 tell us a little bit more about where that fits into perhaps the KGB and Stasi's logic. Like what where, what what is the strategic picture of this? Or is this something driven by forces independent of them? It's it's hard to know exactly where the, the balance of, of these two motivations lie, how how much of Zontag's mission is down to him being a you know dyed in the wall neo Nazi or how much of it is to do with his desire to to get away from this life of drudgery that he he'd been given a chance by the authorities to get away from in the East. It's he does have contact with Schneider, the uh, intermediary, that throughout the time that he's out in the West. Uh, but when he comes back over to the East, to Dresden, after the wall comes down, by then Putin is already on his way out to, to Russia. He's back uh, after, well, after allegedly getting into a little bit of trouble, actually. We spoke to a couple of contacts who sort of said that he was actually sent back after sort of trying to bump up his figures and cook the books a bit with all of his informant numbers. And he was kind of hiring people who were already on the books and uh, and, and being a bit naughty there. So he was sent back. And really what happens after then is some, it seems like it's Sontag really striking out on his own to try and build a movement uh, a far right movement in the east that that is uniquely his, yeah, uh, away from his former group in, over in Langen and from the authorities. Once the wall comes down, Putin and his KGB friends have fled back to Moscow. But Putin's right hand man, former right hand man, Georg Johannes Schneider, is still there in Dresden. And the first thing. Zontag does when he crosses back to the West is make contact with him. He gets back in touch with his, his former handlers and he retains that contact. And what Schneider does on the streets of Dresden, which become the, the scene for gang warfare between left wing and right wing gangs is he uses Sontag in a sort of game to, to play one off against the other using the Nazis to control the right wing and vice versa. And he takes quite a lot of, he takes a kind of Machiavellian delight in this, in arranging for one set of thugs to, to beat up the others. Having said that, if there's any sympathy on the side of the authorities, it appears to be, have been on, um, on the side of the Nazis. And we hear accounts of, for example, young neo-Nazi thugs on the streets of Dresden being arrested by police and then, and then let off while their left-wing counterparts get punished. So this actually brings us close to the end of Zontag's story. Tell us how this experiment in building his own sort of vision of this far right movement back in East Germany goes for him. What does he go about doing and how does it lead to his individual demise, his, his, the end of his story? Sontag is back in on his home turf of Dresden, but Dresden is changing very rapidly. It's open to the West and suddenly on the newsstands, you can see copies of Playboy where, where you just had door propaganda sheets on sale before there are people moving in setting up new businesses and one of the things that Dresden has is a burgeoning red light district and brothels are popping up Zontag is incredibly charismatic he's got a cheeky face he always seems to be smiling whenever we see him in pictures he sets up court in a place called Gorbitz, which is a deprived sort of maze of concrete projects. And there's a youth club there where he hangs out and he gathers um, a, a following of, of young teenager, teenage acolytes who, who um, look up to him, see him as a father figure, and will follow them anywhere. And he, him anywhere. And he appoints himself a vigilante. He says he's going to clear up the town, actually, because of his criminal past. We suspect that he's running a protection racket, but he swears to clean up the town and he swears to, to smash up the brothels. And it's a confrontation with the owners of one of um, Dresden's most notorious brothels that proves to be the end of him. So Sean, tell us a little bit about where this leaves Sontag's legacy. You know, what does he mean as a historical figure, even though he was killed kind of in his prime in a way, in terms of at least the, his his effort to build a movement kind of in his own image. 
he's left kind of an indelible mark on the far right movement in Germany. So tell us a little bit about that legacy and and what he he means today as a historical figure. Yeah, I guess uh, he was cut down in his prime as much as any neo-Nazi could ever be cut down in their prime. Um, He was, yeah, he had this confrontation with the owners of a brothel in in sort of downtown Dresden. Uh, He ended up being shot dead and immediately there was a huge clamor from from the right wing groups uh, across the entire country and you get a memorial march going through Dresden and it's really the biggest it's the biggest far right march since the uh, since the war and from there on Sontag retains this kind of martyrdom within the far right movement in Germany uh, this is a time this is an incredibly febrile time across the newly united country i mean there's far right acts of terror being carried out really really frequently um, in Dresden itself there's a young Mozambican work, uh, slaughterhouse worker called George Gondam- uh, Gomondai. He was thrown from a from a streetcar in in the city and, and killed. Uh, we spoke to a couple of people in the, that lived there at the time. Uh, one was uh, one is a social worker of Pakistani descent, and he told me that he was beaten up a couple of times and he was really fearing for his life. I think a pregnant woman was attacked in a doorway. Uh, I think it was a Vietnamese woman. So this is. A real, a really dangerous time for for anyone, people of color, or any foreigners living in in Germany, then especially in the east. And this self appointed so called sheriff of Dresden, Sontag, has become the rallying cry for for all kinds of far right movements. Uh, there's stuff going on in Rostock on the north in the north of the country. There are riots in in Berlin. And his legacy, it's, it's really, really, I mean, I think personally, it's a, it's a really untold part of the German modern far right. We see it with parties like the AFD, the Alternative for Deutschland. That's the far right party that's gained a hold in parliament in Germany. There's the Begida movement. That's also out of Dresden. Uh, that's, that's an Islamophobic nascent party there. And, Dresden becomes this kind of uh, this 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 kind of focal point for the far right that continues today. And even in 2018, uh, there were huge far right riots in the city of Chemnitz, which is not far from Dresden. And I, I was down there at the time, and I spoke to people who were telling me then that this situation, where the far right had been ignored for so many years under communism, was really the, the bedrock of uh, a lot of the stuff that's still going on today in, in Germany. And of course. The economics of it plays a huge role as well. If you look at many different economic and social factors, you can still see the inner border of East and West Germany. It's poorer. People are less represented. All kinds of problems going on there. And and Sontag was really a a touch point for a lot of these movements. And his march, a lot of people who became big names within the far right across Germany and and elsewhere, uh, there was one of the mentors of, Martin Zellner, who's this Austrian kind of neo-Nazi firebrand, he's been up doing some pro-Russian propaganda of late. Uh, he was at the march. So Sontag and his his death and the rallies that followed it really were some of the most important moments for the far right in Germany in modern times. There's an uncanny parallel between Sontag and Horst Wessel, who was a... SA thug in Hitler's um, Germany in the 1930s who was um, murdered in a street battle and he became a he became a, a martyr for for Hitler's Nazi movement he was just an ordinary good for nothing street brawler but he was lionized and martyred by the movement and that's what happened to Rainer Sontag when he got killed he was turned into a hero even though he was shaking down the brothel owners for protection money when they blew his head away with a shotgun they turned him into the neo-Nazi ideologue that he never was and use him as a, as a rallying point. And as Sean was saying, in the aftermath of his death, Dresden became a real focal point in Germany for neo-Nazi violence. Asylum seekers' homes were torched. People died. And in the aftermath, that legacy continues. Well, speaking of legacies, Lee, let me ask you about another legacy of Sontag's that your story, I think, brings to the front of mind. And that is what 
Vladimir Putin's experience with him may have taught him about engagement with right-wing movements generally. Because we've seen Russia under Putin's leadership really become uh, a focus of global far-right political movements, build relationships with them, formal ones, a variety of informal ones. We've also seen Russia and Putin himself to a substantial degree be lionized by a lot of foreign far-right movements. The idea of Russia being a kind of last Christian nation, uh, an idea being uttered by you know far-right conservatives in the United States and elsewhere. Do you see parallels or potentially connections between Putin's engagement with Sontag and his work with the Stasi and intersection with far-right movements earlier in his career and this sort of strategy that Putin's Russia appears to have settled on in its current iteration in his current role as as the head of the country and and what are those lessons like how does it seem to be informing that strategy I think we should be careful about going too far with the parallels but on the other hand there are definitely some some striking similarities one of the main ones I think is Putin's pragmatism he was there to recruit agents and to exploit them and use them to serve whatever purpose happened to be the purpose of the Soviet state at the time. If that person was a neo-Nazi, it didn't really matter. But he was able to, to exploit those people and turn them to his ends. And that's what we see now. Putin's long instru- instrumentalized the far right all over Europe, if it's his ties with the Front National in France or, or with Matteo Salvini, for example, the far-right um, leader in Italy. But we're also seeing the emergence of, of an ideology. As you've said, Russia is the last Christian nation, the upholder of Christian and, and family values. And that is, I suppose, to use a horrible word, a very postmodern inversion of, of how it might have been in Putin's time growing up in the Soviet Union, where they where the ideology came first and the actions came in the name of the ideology. It's an ideology that's grown up around Putin, and it seems to fit him, and so he's happy to embrace it, just as he was happy to instrumentalize Rainer Zontag and see what happens. He's happy to instrumentalize the far right now. We were lucky enough for the story to speak to Anton Chikovsov, who's a Ukrainian writer and author of the book Tango Noir, which is all about Putin's Russia and its relationship to the far right in Western Europe, like Lee said, in France and Italy and elsewhere. Um, and he w- reiterated that basically Putin... His entire career has always been in service to the state. He's a statist above all, not necessarily an ideologue to to the right or the left wing. And we also spoke to one of his former colleagues and close friends in Dresden at the time at the KGB, who's now living under a different name in a different country. And he said that he wasn't really a good communist, but he was just willing to do anything for the country. So this mobilization of the right wing and sometimes the left wing to cause at times chaos or obeisance to the state, that is certainly something that, you know, maybe maybe Putin didn't necessarily draw a straight line from hiring Rena Zontag to cause chaos in the West as a neo-Nazi, but it certainly follows a pretty decent shaped line all the way through to what he's doing currently. Well, I have to say, I think this has been an absolutely phenomenal conversation, a phenomenal article that you all have put together. Before we part, I, I do want to ask, tell me a little bit about your work and what led you to to come upon this as a, as a research project, as something you've pulled together a lot of primary sources and done a lot of interviews on. What led you to this topic and, and how does it fit into your broader kind of agenda or broader body of work? Uh, Lee, let me start with you. I run Source Material, which is a small nonprofit news, newsroom. We focus on climate and corruption and democracy and where those things intersect. We've been interested in the far right in Europe for some time. I came across a few years ago, just a few lines, quite low down in a long story that a German outfit called Korrektiv had written about Putin's early years in Dresden. And there was this almost tangential mention of Rainer Zontag and how it seemed that he'd had a relationship with Putin. And I became fascinated with this. And when I mentioned it to people, including people I'd expected would have known this type of thing, they're all quite surprised. It was just one of those eyebrow raising things. And so I spent some time in the archives, in the city archives in Dresden, digging up all the documents they had about about Zontag, and then started applying the very long, arduous process of applying to the Stasi archive in 
Berlin to get Rainer Sonntag's file released. And then the pandemic happened and the story got put on the back burner. And I forgot about it for quite some time until I read an article that Sean had done and saw that Sean was based in Berlin and also interested in the similar sort of history of East Germany's far-right movements. And I got in touch with him to see if, be, if he'd been interested in finishing the story off. Yeah, and then we we were kind of able to to meet up, go through some of these Stasi files together. I think we spent a good week actually translating and writing these things out. I mean, they are, as we've said before, unbelievably exhaustive, these uh, kind of spying operations that the East German state carried out on Rainer Zontag all manner of crazy details there. And then we also managed to score a couple of coups in finding some of the contacts that hadn't really spoken about this whole thing before in great detail. So we were able to get sort of some of the details and information and colour along the way that hadn't been reported before. So it all came together. I mean, it was, it, the, the whole process was, was extremely, it took a long time, but we, uh, we kept sort of bumping into these incredible facts as we went along. So um, yeah, it was, it was a pretty amazing story to work on and certainly eye-opening. I mean, the history of this far right in East Germany is, it's really, it really, really does inform so much of what's going on in Germany right now today. And obviously with Putin and the war in Ukraine and the invasion. So yeah, it's, it's extremely poignant and, and timely, but it's also, um, I think, uh, full of kind of intrigue and Cold War espionage and all these other things that make a pretty good story besides. Absolutely. Well, tell us where, if we want to find more work by you all on these topics or or sort of related topics that you all are working on, where is the best place to find that? Lee, I'll start with you. You can find the work that I do with my colleagues on our website, which is source-material.org. Uh, I'm a freelancer, so you can find my work all over the place. <laughs> uh, you can search for my name. I'm on Twitter at um, S. Williams Journo. I'm not the guy who writes episodes of Star Trek. I'm the other one. Um, and then you can also find work that I do on organized crime with my podcast, which is called Underworld, and that's underworldpod.com. Wonderful. Well, Lee Baldwin, Sean Williams, thank you for joining us here today on the Lawfare Podcast. Thank you. Thanks. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Please be sure to rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts and check out Lawfare's other podcasts, including Rational Security, a casual, lighthearted chat about national security news that I co-host each week with my colleagues Quinta Jurassic and Alan Rosenstein. Also, be sure to visit lawfareblog.com for our extensive written coverage of national security law and policy issues, and consider becoming a material supporter of Lawfare at patreon.com slash lawfare to gain access to an ad-free version of this podcast and other special perks. This podcast was edited by Jen Patcha Howell, and our audio engineer was Kara Schillen of Goat Rodeo. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thank you for listening.